Cassidy Ann. That she had my feet. She had one, her second toe was longer than her first toe. And I was like disappointed in that, I guess, because I didn't want her to have to have what I've always considered ugly toes, you know. Welcome to Still a Part of Us, a place where moms and dads share the story of their child who was stillborn or who died in infancy. I'm Winter. And I'm Lee. We are grateful you joined us today. Please note that this is a story of loss and has triggers. Thanks to our lost parents who are willing to be vulnerable and share their children with us. If you're listening to this podcast, just know that on our YouTube channel, there are pictures and videos that are related to the stories that are being shared. Subscribe and share it with a friend that might need it and tell them to subscribe. Why? Because people need to know that even though our babies are no longer with us, they're still a part of us. Welcome to Still a Part of Us. We are very excited to talk to Lori here. We have a little bit of a unique situation where we have somebody that has had a loss that's been a little bit longer than just a year or a couple of years or a few years. You've got a number of years since your loss, Lori. So thank you so much for reaching out to us and for being willing to share Cassidy's story with us. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about who you are, just so that we can kind of know who you are. And then can you give give us a little bit of an idea of how long ago Cassidy was born? Sure. So she was born um, in 1997. So she would be, (laughs) forgive my math here. What is that? She would be 27 this year, right? I think think that's right. Yeah, 27. That's hard to believe. Um, our family was living in Grand Rapids, Michigan at the time. And, um, my husband worked for, um, a big supermarket chain. If anybody's in Michigan, they will know (laughs) which one I mean. Okay. It's like the The, biggest one. Okay. (laughs) And, um, and he was working in their audio visual department and, um, our oldest son was actually turning nine. He and Cassie share a birthday. And um, so that was another dynamic to our situation. Yeah. Um, our, our second son was seven, and then our daughter was almost four. So okay. we had the three of them, and then Cassie was our fourth. And, you know, my situation was a little bit different, I think, than a lot of people because she wasn't planned and she was very unexpected. Yeah. And I was very sad to be pregnant. That's a very real feeling and it, it almost makes, I just feel horrible when I think back to that time yeah. and how I was feeling about it um, because she was our fourth child. And for whatever reason, I just had this terrible thought that people were going to look at us and say, oh, don't you know what causes that? You know, you know, you got four kids and, you know, don't you know how to stop that, you know, kind of thing. And, and it's, It was really silly and I shouldn't have been worried about that. But after I had Abby, who was our um, third child, Mm -hmm. um, I, my health really took a nosedive. My thyroid stopped working. Um, I had a lot of depression that set in. Um, It wasn't, it wasn't really postpartum depression, but I guess it was because it was after she was born, but it started about when she was about four months old. Okay. And, um, So I fought with that for a long time. And and I remember, you know, trying to handle her as a newborn and my two little boys who would have been, you know, four and two, five and three, something like that. Right. They would, they would walk down the sidewalk to the neighbor's house and I didn't think anything of it. Now, granted, this was in 1997. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Things were a little bit different because we lived in a real tiny neighborhood, really tiny town. But people, you know, the neighbors would come back and say, oh, the boys were walking down the street again. And I just felt like a total failure because I couldn't, um, I couldn't do my job as a mom, you know, and Abby's birth was like something totally different. Like I wanted to breastfeed really badly. And I hadn't been able to breastfeed our second son and breastfeeding all around was just a horrendous thing for me. It was hard. (laughs) Um, And and then when I had Abby, then I did took steps to make it better. And I was able to successfully nurse her without problems until she was about six months old. Okay, great. So, but anyway, having said all that, 
um, after she was born and my health went downhill and, and then I got pregnant again and we weren't expecting it. And I, I had always said I wanted four children, but at that point I was like, I'm not really sure I'm ready for a fourth one. Right. You know? Yeah. Postpartum does kind of do a number on you. It really makes you start, stop and think is, yeah, can I do it again? Was that, that was so hard or. Yeah. And, I, and I'm assuming back in, you know, that would have been what, 90, 94, 95 Four. when you had Abby mm-hmm. and there was not tons of talk about postpartum <laughs> depression. No. And no, there wasn't a lot of help for anything really. I mean, yeah. you know, we didn't have regular ultrasounds. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know she would, that Abby, I didn't know she was a girl until I was 39 weeks pregnant. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's because um, the doctor, well, we had moved, we moved from Niles, Michigan to Grand Rapids when I was eight months pregnant with Abby. Oh, whoa. And, <laughs> yeah. Had three weeks, mind you, to pack up our entire house and move to Grand Rapids. Yeah. So, whoa. so that, yeah, because my husband had gotten um, a, a, the new job and right. that's why we moved up there. So the doctor that we went to in Michigan didn't do routine ultrasounds mm. at, at any point. Um, a lot of places didn't. And so when we moved to Grand Rapids, my boys had had hand, foot and mouth disease. Oh. And I was just kind of concerned, you know, because here I am pregnant and oh, could I get that and whatever. And Would that affect the I baby? Was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I was just really... Um, very concerned about that. And my new doctor, what a precious man he was. And he said, you know, if it will, if it will calm your nerves, let's go ahead and do an ultrasound just to make sure she's okay. So I was 39 weeks and like four days. (laughs) And that was when we found out she was a girl. So um, yeah, so it's, I know it's a hard to look back like when I watched the other girls stories on here and listened to them talk I'm like oh I wish I'd had that back then like the cuddle cot there yeah. was no such thing as that back yeah. then just you know? a different different time and the it technology was. and the access to care is is different yeah it's very different yeah very much people have come a long way I think in the in the whole infant loss yes. community you know so, so Cassie was, she was definitely not planned. And right. when you found out, how did you find out? Was it just like missed period, that type of thing, not feeling great? Yeah, I think so. Um, it must have been that I missed a period probably because mm-hmm. I was always really regular. Yep. You know, I could always knew when I ovulated and that kind of stuff. And I'm trying to think back. And I think that's what it was. And then I probably took a test, you know, but my other pregnancies I had, I had a miscarriage between my boys. So between my oldest and second boy, then we had a miscarriage then too. So throughout those pregnancies, all of them, I was, I mean, I got sick like in the first trimester, like most people do, Yeah. but with Cassidy, the sickness just continued. It just like, I was nauseous most days and, um, trying to care for three kids and, you know, I just didn't feel mm-hmm. good. You know, yeah. very hard. That, yeah, very hard. And what did your husband say when you guys found out that you were pregnant a fourth time? Oh, he was very happy. Was he? <laughs> he was. He was very excited. Yeah. I and he tried. You know, he really. Um, you know, my husband is such a blessing to me. We've been married. Um, it'll be thirty-seven years this Wonderful. year. So. Congratulations! That's amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. Yeah. So he, he is my rock. And, um, so he tried really hard then to just tell me, you know, it's going to be okay. You know, we, I know that you are, you know, sad about this, but it, it's all going to work out, you know? And, and, um, so he was, he was very encouraging, but he was really happy that we were going to have one more. Cause we'd always talked about having four. four. Yeah. <laughs> so. And so you're like, it was kind of part of the plan, but also it's hard when you've had, have some rough patches with postpartum. Right. So yeah, definitely. Okay. And then were, what was the care like when you um, got pregnant? So did you go in for kind of checkups on a regular basis? Um, obviously no ultrasounds, no extra checks or anything like that. So how how did that look in those first, you know, first trimester, second trimester? Right. I, um, 
we I did go in for probably, um, I think probably when I was like 12 weeks, I think Mm -hmm. Um, I went in and, you know, scheduled the appointment in it. And thankfully it was with the same doctor that I had with Abby. And like I said, he was, he was a precious man. He was just, he had six children of his own and he wore a little bow tie every time, you know, in the (laughs) office, he was just cute as can be, you know, just so sweet. So I was very happy to be in that office and they were always kind and and everything, but pretty much everything went the same. And and by that point in time, at least at their office, they were actually doing a 20 week scan, which I'd never had that before either. So really, okay. um, That is a big deal. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, we, like, like I said, you know, we didn't know that uh, what any of the sexes of our children were except Mm -hmm. Abby at the last minute. And so I was really excited to be like, oh my goodness, I I get to find out the sex I had to die. (laughs) Yeah. But they didn't have any worries or anything. Everything looked good um, yep. throughout the, the first couple trimesters there. Yeah, um, yep. And then Everything for the fine. ultrasound, that 20-week scan, was your husband there? I mean, was it just you or how did the, how did that look for you? Yeah, he, he went with me that day. And um, so we both got to see her. And, of course, we were both, you know, tears pouring down our face. My oh. husband is a very very sensitive guy, you know, and he just, he cries in our family. We joke that dad's having a moment. That's what we say. <laughs> but, and interestingly enough, my sons are both like, like that. They're just very tender hearted and compassionate, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, yeah, we were thrilled. And then when they said it was a, another girl, oh man. We, and at that point I was just like, oh, okay, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. Abby will have a sister to play with. We'll have two boys and two girls and our family will be complete, you know? And then, you know, at that point, then I just became thrilled, you know, yeah. it's like all the depression. I don't know for what reason, but I guess when I realized that she would be another girl and and I was so thankful to have a girl and one girl, you know? Yeah. Um, so that, I don't know, I guess maybe that just kind of helped me feel better about it or something. Yeah. But that, I mean, it switched for you. So that's, that's always good just to kind of like, Oh, there's our family. That's, that's the way our family's going to look. And yes, exactly. Cause I knew I wasn't having any more after, (laughs) you know, I was like, no way. We're we're done. We're good. We're good. (laughs) (laughs) Um, okay. So then once you found out that it was going to be a girl, did you guys have names chosen now? Are you, were you like, planning that kind of thing. I always like to ask because it's fun to see where people come up with with their names. Oh, absolutely. Well, when I was 14 years old, I had a list of girls' names. yeah. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. running. I mean, I just like, I, I have been a mother, motherly person, I guess, since Mm -hmm. I was tiny. My mom said that when I was two years old, I already had 20 baby dolls (laughs) and they would get me, she'd get me one all the time, you know, but yeah. um, but I, you know, started babysitting when I was nine years old yeah. for, you know, the neighbor. And I, you know, I, I always, it's um, a point of pride. No, not really. But people loved when I babysat because I didn't just babysit, but I like cleaned things up. I cleaned up the kitchen. I, you know, picked up the toys. And yeah. I'm like, then when I became a mom, I'm like, oh, that's the kind of babysitter everybody wants. <laughs> it's know? totally true. Yeah. I was like, and I, I got, I, yeah. Yeah, I got <laughs> one of those too as oh, a mom. God. Thankfully, <laughs> bless her heart. She, she's just precious. But anyway, so, um, yeah, so I babysat and um, my college um, education, my major in college was childhood education, oh, uh-huh. um, early childhood education, actually, like preschool and stuff. So, um, yeah, I just, and what, what what did you just ask me? Oh, I was just asking um, what kind of name that you guys decided oh, on. Because right, right. <laughs> so, you had a running I, list of names, which is awesome. <laughs> yes, I did. And the boy names were a little bit harder, but oh, yes, we, yeah. we did we did after, um, since we'd had two boys, you know, if she was a boy, we had the name going to be Benjamin Joseph and for whatever reason. And then, um, but for Cassie, I wanted to have Abby and Annie. And those okay. were the two names that I just wanted. I just loved Annie. She was going to be Annie Grace. And, you know, well, then my husband decided, you know, you named the first girl. Maybe, <gasps> could I name this one? You know, he like literally asked me that. <laughs> So I'm like, yes, you can name her, you know, not having any idea what he was going to choose. And he said, well, 
I, I've got this name. I really like it, but you probably won't like it and you won't like where I got it. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, tell me. And he's like, well, it's a character on Star Trek. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. So I was like, oh, you know, and he's like, her name is Cassidy. And I was just like, huh, well, that's a nice name. <laughs> it is a <laughs> nice know? name. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he, I said, we knew her middle name. Well, at that point, if she was Annie, she wouldn't have been Annie Ann because Ann is my middle name. Oh, yes. So, right. So she would, you know, but Cassidy, we thought Cassidy Ann went together well. So yes, it does. It's got good rhythm. I like it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you know, of course, Abby's name is Abigail. And so she couldn't just be Cassidy. She had to be Cassie like Abby. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Both. So cute. So cute. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's fun to like have that. Um, and then your due date, um, you said that your one of your sons shares Cassie's birthday. Um, wh- yeah. Was your due date kind of around that time? It was my due date, I believe, was October 3rd or October 4th, some, something like that. But but yes, I you know, something that I never realized before, but with a, a lot of women, our ovulation must go back to the same area in time because a lot of people I know have two, you know, two babies born at the same time yes. of year. I think so. I think that's correct. Cause we, that happens in our family. I like in our family yeah. too. It's like, huh, interesting. Yeah. So, um, I, and I never realized that before, but, um, but yeah, she was due around the same time. Our oldest son was born. He was born on September 23rd. So that, we we had planned his birthday party for mm-hmm. the night that I delivered Cassie. So after we found out that she had died, um, bless his heart, he called his little friends on the phone and told them that we had to postpone his birthday party because his baby sister had died. Oh. And he, you know, he's such a compassionate person, even today. And it just just breaks my heart when I think about him doing that as a little guy. He just yeah. just took charge and called, made those phone calls because he knew that mama couldn't do it. Yeah. You know. So. Oh man. So and I didn't think I would cry this <laughs> in this whole thing, but yeah. never say never in this. <laughs> yeah, I know. When you're talking about your kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we talk about our kids. You know, we, when, when, um, Ezra is my oldest son's name, um, when he was, gosh, I don't know how old he was. Cause Abby was five. So this would have been after Cassie, but, um, we lived on kind of the corner of kind of a busy street. Mm-hmm. We lived right next to a fire department and then there was a stoplight there and an accident had happened one day out there. And it was, I mean, it wasn't a horrible death. It wasn't a fatal accident uh-huh. or anything, but yeah. I was up in their bedroom looking out towards the street when I heard this big crash, you know? So the next thing I see is Ezra and Evan, who is two and a half years younger. And they were walking out to the car that had a little girl inside of it. And she was standing outside the car and they were taking their stuffed animals to her. And they had chosen their, their favorites. And he had a, like a Pikachu that was his favorite. And then Evan, he, my second son is just a sports boy all around, you know, loves sports. And he had this little Charlotte Hornets mascot. Oh, okay. And a yeah, stuffy. Yeah. And it was his favorite thing. Yeah. And he took that out to that little girl and they gave those to her. And I'm telling you, my kids just surprised me all the time. I with know that kind spirit. You they, know? they sound so sweet and so yeah. caring. They were, yeah, they really, they really were. And they still are, but yeah. some of the things they did as children just blew me away, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so kids have that capacity to, yeah, see a need and <laughs> yes. try and yeah, reach out and exactly. take care. I think it's really cool. Yeah. So, um, you guys are planning and everything is going well. You're feeling a little bit better. Um, um, yeah, yeah, I was feeling, feeling better. Abby's birthday was like, um, the 5th of August and we had a little birthday party for her. Oh well, yeah, I guess so she was four already. Um, anyway, that was, 
it was the only picture of me pregnant that we have. Oh, if you from can that birthday that. party. Huh. Yeah, at that birthday party. And I'm holding her and I can see my belly. And um, with every other pregnancy, I took maternity, you know, not like formal maternity pictures. No, but, but you took, took like bump of, pictures, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, except with Cassie, that's the only one that I have. And so, yeah, but but yeah, I um, things were going well. By that point, I, I felt good. And I had only I only gained about 12 pounds with her, mm. um, which was another thing I was so worried about, you know, the whole vanity of Oh, how much weight am I going to gain, you know, yeah. because but I had never had never taken it all off from my first pregnancy. Oh, yeah. so, you know, it just it's a kept packing on. <laughs> yeah, packing on pounds, you know, so yeah, so I gained 12 pounds, only 12 pounds, but they didn't seem to have a problem with that. They said, you know, um, if things were, were going fine. And then I went in for, um, you know, so by, what is it, like 36 or 30, 37 weeks, I guess you go in like weekly, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. So I went in, my appointments were on Monday mornings, and I always took Abby with me, and Matt was at work, boys were in school. And so we went and it was my, it was 37 weeks. And, um, so they're, you know, got me on the table and they're looking for her heartbeat. And so, you know, they didn't find it right away, you know, and they're like, Oh, I, she's probably sleeping in there. Let's see if we can wake her up, you know, and they kind of jostled my stomach and, and then they got her heart rate. And I think it was like in the one forties. So they, you know, everything was okay, you Mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. So, um, we went home and, you know, the week progressed as it, as it was going to. And, um, you know, like I said, we were looking towards having Ezra's birthday party. So on Sunday would have been the 22nd, 21st, Sunday, September 21st, we came home from church and I was making lunch in the kitchen and I was standing by, I will never forget this as long as I live, standing by the counter, looking out this little window and she, Cassie kicked me as hard, harder than anything I've ever felt in my life. Like she had never done that before. None of, well, Evan did it, our second born. He used to kick and roll. And I mean, yeah, okay. he, he was crazy. He was all over. Okay. Yeah. But she had never done that before. She was, she was a pretty quiet baby anyway. Um, mm. All my kids laid side to side. Mm. So I was always like wide, <laughs> you know, and, um, So, you know, I knew right where her feet were and she kicked so hard that she kicked against the counter and I actually just doubled over in pain. You know, I just was like, what in the world, you know, and, and then I stood up and everything seemed okay. You know, I wasn't like, I didn't have any bleeding. I never, my water never broke with any of my children. (laughs) So that didn't happen, you know, and, and then she was okay. And so I'm like, hmm, well, that is very strange. But I thought, yeah. well, we are getting closer to, to delivery, you know, so like they always tell you, they don't have much room in there, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, so that was on Sunday. And so I went to bed that night, got up the next morning, and Abby and I went to the doctor's appointment for the 38th week. And um, went in and did all the normal stuff we do, weigh you, check your blood pressure, you know, all mm-hmm. the stuff. Mm-hmm. And so they're getting ready to listen to the heartbeat and she could only find mine. And, you know, of course, like every other mom I've listened to, you know, they start like moving or the Doppler around, you know, looking and listening and, and then um, I'll be right back. I'm just going to have somebody else come in and see if they can find it, you know, cause they're trying to not, you know, be dramatic or whatever, I'm sure that they right. must know at that point that yeah. their child is no longer alive, you know? And so another nurse came in and she tried, um, and my doctor wasn't there that he was actually in deliveries that day. And so one of the other doctors from the practice came in and checked it. And he said, I, I, I don't know what to say. He said, she's, she's just not alive anymore or what, you know, I don't even know how he said it. And I just sat there shocked, you know, I mean, there's just like, there's no words and, you know, Abby's in the room with me and 
I'm all by myself. My Mm. husband, literally, he he wasn't even at work. He was in Florida for work. (laughs) So here I am in Grand Rapids. We have no family anywhere Mm. near us. Closest family was about four hours away. And, um, but my, my dear friend, Rachel, she, she and I had just been friends. And so I'm like, well, I I guess I got to call her because somebody's got to watch Abby. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I just didn't even know what I was doing. So they said, Let, let's send you over to the hospital to, they because they didn't tell me that she had died. I think they just said, we're having a hard time finding the heartbeat or something to that effect. Okay. But it was very clear to me that she was already gone. Yeah. You know. And so, it really hit, it, did that hit you? Like, did that, did you fully understand what they were saying? Um, I, I think I did mind you this, it, for me, you know, it's been 20, almost 27 years. Yes, and yes, so yes. people are probably like, oh, she's not even emotional about this. But, no, um, but trying to just, you know, like relive it. There are parts I, I remember well and then parts I don't. So I, I don't remember a whole lot except pretty much knowing that she surely must not be alive. Because if they can't find her heartbeat, right. what is going to the hospital going to help me with? You know, right. like they're going to send me to the hospital to have, um, what did they say? A more advanced ultrasound gotcha. is what they said. Okay. And I, so I had to drive, you know, by myself. I took Abby to my friend Rachel's house. The whole, I mean, somebody, one of the, one of the, uh, your episodes I listened to yesterday and I don't remember who it was. I think it was, it might've been Ivy's mom. I can't mm-hmm. remember. Anyway, mm-hmm. they said, I was driving. I don't even know how fast I was driving. I was just driving to get there, you know? Yep. And um, that was me. I was taking, um, I had to take like a little highway, like Rachel's house was probably 25 minutes, 20, 25 minutes away. So I had to take Abby to Rachel's house and I I had to make sure that Rachel could pick my boys up from school because I didn't know what was going to happen now. And, um, and so anyway, so I dropped Abby off the whole time. I'm speeding down the road, driving back. And I'm just saying, Lord, pl- please don't let this be real. Please, you know, if there's anything you can do, please save my baby. You know, to, like, what can we do here? And, you know, I just kept, you know, just just calling out, Jesus, please, please don't take her, you know. And, and of course, then feeling so much incredible guilt that I hadn't wanted her in the beginning. You know, that just killed me because I felt like, like I was being punished, you know, like this was your punishment because you didn't want this baby in the beginning. And, you know, you know, I blessed you with this baby, you know, and, and I know God doesn't punish us like that. I know that's not true, but you know, in that moment you feel things that you never think you would feel, you know, because I was, I was so sad and I was so angry, you know, that this was happening. And so I got to the hospital and they took me up to the labor and delivery floor and um, put me in a room with a little symbol on the door. Like, you know, (sighs) most of, um, you know, the other women have talked about. Yeah. And I don't remember exactly what it was. I think it was like a rose of some sort. And um, I went in that room. And so they already were prepared for the fact that she wasn't alive. And uh, so I, you know, laid down on the table and they hooked me up to this more advanced ultrasound. You know, I I don't know if there is such a thing anymore, you know, (laughs) but back then there was. And, um, you know, I could, um, I could see her you know, that she wasn't moving and there, there was, there was no heart, you know, there's no little pulsing of that heart, you know? Yeah. And so I, I really don't even remember what I did at that point. I just, I'm sure that I must've just been, you know, crying, moaning, yeah. you know, and I think maybe, maybe I might have been a little bit concerned with, not hurting someone else's feelings that were in the room or something like, I, I don't want them to see me, you know, you know, fall to pieces here or something. And, um, but I don't know, I could be wrong about that. Maybe I never even thought that at all, but, but maybe I think 
later on in life, I may have just thought that that's what happened. You know, I, I don't even remember so many things are so foggy. Yeah. Um, but, um, anyway, they said, well, who can we call for you? And I'm like, oh, great. Who can you call? Well, my husband's in Florida, you know, Yeah. he, he, um, he actually, he, he, my husband works, if I'm allowed to say where he works, I don't know. Um, he, but he works for ESPN now. Mm -hmm. So his career has always been in video. And then once when we were in Grand Rapids, we eventually ended up moving from Grand Rapids a few years later because he started um, to become a freelance um, operator Mm -hmm. where he was his own employer, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. And he had started doing some of that on the side um, while he was working um, for Meyer, which is the big grocery store mm-hmm, chain. Mm-hmm. And um, so this particular event that he was at was his very first going out on his own thing. <laughs> right. And so it was kind of a big deal that he needed to be there. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, um, you know, back then, everybody, anybody who listens will probably be like, oh my gosh. But back then, all we had was pagers. Yeah. We didn't have a cell phone. Mm-hmm. I didn't get my first cell phone until 1998, maybe. Yeah. Yep. That's about Um, right. (laughs) Yeah. So um, he had a pager and, and, um, you know, well, wait a minute. Is that right? You know what? Now that I'm saying that, I'm like, that's not right. Because that was when Abby was born that he had the pager. But I still don't know if I had a cell phone. Because they called from a landline. That's that's why I'm trying to remember. Did I have yeah. a cell phone then? I'm not sure that I did, but they did call from the hospital room, like right. from the landline yeah. to get in yeah. touch with them. Okay. Sorry, that's a little confusing. But um, so I had the number for Matt, but I don't know. I don't think it was a cell phone either because they had to go and look for him. Like mm-hmm. I had a number that was maybe like a, a landline there. So yeah. They could like, actually, they would have to go find him. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. actually. Right. Yeah. And so, um, they got in touch with them and I guess that, you know, whoever answered the phone on that end in Florida, then went to look for him and mind you, he was brand new. I might, mm-hmm. it's like a wonder they even knew who he was because, mm-hmm. you know, he not worked with this, you know, this crew before and they didn't know him. He didn't know them. And so they just went and got him and told him he had a, an emergency phone call. And um, the nurse was the one who did all of that for me. She actually got him um, on the phone. And she said, you know, this is nurse so-and-so from, you know, St. Mary's Hospital. And um, I have your your wife is here with us. And mm-hmm. we, you know, she needs to speak with you. And I can't imagine what was going through his mind because oh, it could have yeah. been so many different things, you know? So, um, he got on the phone and I just, you know, I wish I could remember exactly what wording I used to Mm -hmm. tell him, but I think I probably said the baby died. You know, I don't think I used her name. I, you know, I think I just said, you know, just the baby died. And (laughs) of course, like everyone else's husband, I'm sure he said, what? Yeah. Well, what, yep. what do you mean? What, you know, what, happened? what are you talking about? You know? And, um, I just said, they, you know, don't know what happened. I went to the appointment this morning. Um, and there was no heartbeat. And of course he, you know, I think he was in shock too, because he didn't like break down weeping on the phone, you know, like yeah. it wasn't, you know, broke down and was a weeping blubbering mess at that yeah. point in time. So he said, Oh, well, I got to get home. What What am I going to do? I've, I've got to get home, you know? And I said, well, you know, I mean, you can do what you can to get here. I mean, right. I, cause we didn't know what was going to happen. Like, yeah. would they let him leave? I mean, his position was core to this event that he, he was at. I was, yeah. And, um, so they got him an emergency flight home. And, and another part of this too, um, winter is that we were very poor, <laughs> We were a young family. Young family, and, exactly. Uh, yeah, we were young and we didn't have extra money for an emergency flight home. Right. But I believe that they paid for it. Somebody oh. paid for his flight to get him um, out. I don't know if it was the airline. I, I don't know who did that. 
but um, anyway, he ended up getting home about midnight. Oh, that so, day. Okay. Yeah. So there are all those hours that I had to spend, you know, waiting for him. And I just, I just, I was just in shock. I mean, I honestly really don't remember much of anything that happened Mm -hmm. during those hours until he came home. Um, And were you at the hospital still or did they end up sending you home? They, they did send me home. They, they ended up, I was there for probably, well, not for very long, you know, because There was nothing they could do. So, yeah, so they sent me home. And I remember, I think, going to Rachel's house because it was my appointment would have been at like 10 ish in the morning. So I don't mm-hmm. really know, but it seems like my kids were already out of school. So it may have been around 3 30 or 4. That's what seems right to me that I ended up getting, you know, to her house because, um, you know, while I was at the hospital, we talked about what are we going to do? Yeah. You know, and they were like, well, you can, you know, you can keep her in, you can, you know, it, until your body spontaneously goes into labor, which I don't, I mean, I don't know how you do that. If you're, if your baby's already died, like, does your body just automatically know to expel it? I, I don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, but that was an option. And I was like, Oh, my goodness, no, you know, I, I can't just keep her in there knowing that she's not alive. And, um, and at this point, they had no idea why, right. you know, they didn't know if there were birth defects, even though they never seen they had never seen anything on the yeah. scan. But after that five week scan, I hadn't had any other ultrasounds, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. still that was not a regular thing, even in that last month. They didn't do regular ultrasounds. Yeah. So I just remember he's like, well, you can stay here and deliver or you can go home and and choose another day to deliver, you know, and I knew I didn't want to deliver then because Matt wasn't there. You know, I needed him to be there with me. And, you know, I asked if I could just have a (laughs) C-section. Can can you just put me out and take out the baby? And, you know, and they were like. Unfortunately, we know we can't do it that way. It's too, there's too much risk to you, you know, and, and, um, a major surgery like that. And I just, oh my goodness, just the, the horror to me of knowing I was going to have to deliver her, you know, that, oh my goodness, that was just that. I just hated that thought. Yeah. How in the world am yeah. I going to do this? You yeah. Know? And I had had all three of my babies naturally. I had never had like an epidural even, (laughs) although boy, do I wish I would have said yes to, you know, uh, earlier, but I had (laughs) been, I had been induced with Evan. So I knew what an induction was, what an induction would be like. Mm -hmm. Um, And all of my babies came within 12 hours from start to finish of labor. Wow. Okay. So 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 I I had them. Yeah, I had them really, you know, pretty fast. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, you, m- most of the time, I think five pushes with my first baby was all it took for him Whoa. to come out. So things just kind of went boom, boom, boom for me typically. So yeah. I knew that being induced, it wasn't going to take long once we got moving along and stuff. So I said, I'm going to go home and I'll talk to Matt, I believe is what I said. And the doctor gave me his personal phone number and said, here's my, my number. You call me when you have decided what you want to do. He's like, you just go home, you talk to him about it. You know, well, I'm sure he wasn't thinking that my husband wasn't going to get home till midnight, (laughs) you know, either, but he had said, you call me whenever, I don't care what time it is. You call and let me know what you want to do. So we went home and I remember picking up the kids from Rachel's and I believe I must have called a friend from church because we did, like I said, we didn't have any family there. Yeah. Um, we just had our church family and then Rachel, yeah. <laughs> those yeah. were, you know, our those neighbors, your, but we yeah. didn't really know them. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And so, um, I called my friend and asked her if she would come over and sit with me and I explained what had happened. And I said, you know, I've got 
you know, the kids are all, all three kids are here. I need to feed them. I need to bathe them. I need to get them ready for whatever's going to happen next. And, you know, I just like, I didn't really know what I was even ta- I saying, you know, I just like, yeah. Can you just, just come over, please, you know? And she did. And she made them dinner. Um, I remember her doing some laundry. I remember sitting on the couch and folding some laundry, <laughs> which, you know, I think the reason why we women do laundry is because it's like mindless work. Yes. You know, like when you're folding laundry, you don't have to think about anything. You yes. just like fold, like you just know what you're doing. You fold your towels a certain way, yep. you fold your shirts, you know, and, and you're just doing it. And um, I remember doing that. And then after that, I don't remember anything. Like I don't remember anything from the time my friend was there. She must have probably put the kids to bed and then gone back home to her family, I would assume. She lived about 30 minutes from us. And um, I don't remember if we talked about maybe she would keep my boy, you know, I I think because what I had decided was that I couldn't have my children there with me. Okay. For whatever reason, it may be, I know that probably seems odd to some people. Um, no, I don't know. Nope, no, I, I don't think that it, that is a hard decision to make and introduce. I mean, yeah, like there's, there's so many possibilities that it could cause trauma, but it also could. Right. Yeah. So I, I, there's no judgment there. Cause I think everybody goes through that actually. Right. With and, other kids. and of course the next day, the 23rd was Ezra's ninth birthday. Yeah. And how I didn't know how he would handle it being his birthday. And I, you know, I just didn't know what the right thing to do was. So what we decided then when Matt got home that night and we talked about it and of course, you know, he, I think he probably had to take a cab home or somebody picked him up. I think, I think one of our church friends picked him up and brought him home. But I think what, you know, he, he was devastated, obviously. And he came in and dropped his bags and just ran over and we just, you know, hugged and just wept, you know, for, I don't know how long I remember not going to bed until about two o'clock. So I'm sure we must have just held each other for a couple hours and just wept and talked about what we were going to do, what are our next steps going to be, yeah. where is she going to be buried? You know, are we going to have a funeral? I mean, all those things bombard you at one time and you just don't know what to do, you know? So, you know, once we just, um, talked through it, we decided that we were going to go in and be induced in the morning, the next morning that we would send our boys to school and that Rachel would keep Abby. And we basically, I'm sure we must have told them Cassie, you know, Cassie died or, she's not going to be able to come home with us or, or something, yeah. but I didn't want them to worry. Like I didn't want them to be at school all day thinking, Oh, my, my baby sister died and she's coming out now. And, you know, I, I just yeah. didn't know how much they could understand and handle. And, yeah. you know, even though I knew my boys were very sensitive and, and very compassionate, but so we just sent them to school. Matt and I dropped them off just like it was any other day, you know, and yeah. said goodbye. Okay. Now Rachel's going to be here to pick you up, you know, and we just tried to be as normal as we could for them. And so um, then we took Abby to Rachel's and then we went to the hospital and um, got there and they started the Pitocin, you mm-hmm. know, and I believe that we started that about well, it would have been about nine, nine yeah. or nine thirty, because the kids didn't. We didn't have, need to get them to school until like eight thirty, I guess. Yeah. So it was yeah. probably about it was probably about nine thirty ish, ten o'clock or something, maybe when they started it, the, the drip. And um, I don't remember. I I heard one of the moms say the other day that they didn't hook up the monitor, the fetal monitor, you know, because there was no heartbeat. So why would you need a heartbeat monitor, you know? And I, so I, that, you know, kind of like made me think, did we do that? And I I don't know, they may have done that for me, but I I honestly don't remember. I just Mm -hmm. remember getting um, hooked up to machines. And I remember they said, um, do you want an epidural or 
what kind of pain management oh, do okay. you want yeah. is, is how they said it. And because I'm sure I had told them that I had not had drugs before right. for my, for my pregnancy or for my deliveries, not always by choice. One time I wanted them and it was too late. Yes. <laughs> That's what they told me. That happens. You know, oh, sorry, yeah. you're too far gone now. You yep, know? So, yep. But um, I said, I would like an epidural and they're like, no problem. Well, we're going to get that set up for you. We call the anesthesiologist or, you know, whatever they have to do. They were so lovely to me. They were oh, so kind. And, you know, like I said, at this point, no one knew why she died. It, she just was gone. And they were just, they were just so awesome. Um, anyway, and they, they gave me anything I wanted, you know, so when I said I, I would like an epidural, well, that's, that's what we did. Well, Believe it or not, the epidural only took on one side of my body. <laughs> so uh, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, it but, is. <laughs> yeah. So I, I didn't know because I'd never had one before. But I didn't know that, that that was a thing. And it ended up that only one side of my lower half was, was numb. And again, I just thought, again, that was, the, you know, I, and I, like like I said before, I don't believe God punishes us for things. And I don't believe that he's this man in the sky who sits up there and looks down on us and throws trials and tribulations our way yeah. just to spite for spite. You know, I, yeah. I don't, I do not believe that, that at all, but that's how it felt in that day at that, at that time, it felt like, Oh, great. Well, here we are, Lord. You know, I wanted Here's an another epidural. Thing. Yeah. And, and you gave me half a one. Well, that's just great. Thanks a lot. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah. I just, I, I hate that I ever even thought that, but what I do know is God's grace is there for us. And it was, it was there for me. And I know that God is a loving God and um, he took care of us unbelievably. Like I never thought I could ever go through something like this. You know, I mean, you hear about other people, it happening to them and you're like, oh my goodness, I could never go through that or losing someone's family in a car accident or your house burning down or, you know, oh, I could never go through that, but you could and God gives you the grace to do it, you know? So, um, anyway. So we were in the, in the room and they had me all hooked up and, you know, Matt was there with us and, you know, I don't even remember how he told our families. Like, mm -hmm. I don't, I know he did, he made all the phone calls. So I don't know if he did it before the, you know, before she was delivered. Yeah. I think he probably did because of him getting home at midnight there's no time to call then, you right. know, his mom was four hours away and my folks were five hours away. And, um, so I think what, it, that's what it was when they were prepping me that morning, he was in the hall making phone calls and saying, this is what happened. We're at the hospital. She's being induced. We're going to deliver when we do, we'll let you know, or yeah. whatever, yeah. you know, we knew that none of our family would be able to come you yeah, know, um, Matt's away. mom yeah. was, um, a widow. His, his dad passed when he was 50 from leukemia. Oh. So she had been a widow for many years and still was, and was working full time because she had to support herself, you yeah. know? And my mom was, my mom had rheumatoid arthritis very, very badly and, um, was type one diabetic and, just, and my, you know, she couldn't work. My dad worked full time to support them. So, I mean, I'm sure that they could, he could have taken off work that, you know, they would have let him, Yeah. but I didn't want him to do that. You know, I, yes. I just wanted them to just stay put. I knew my mom wouldn't travel very well. And so there really wasn't an option for anybody, for our families to be with us, you know? But he did call and, and tell him, and, and of course, his brothers and sisters were here, here, there, and everywhere, you know, across the country. In fact, his one of his older um, his older sister, um, she and I were pregnant three times together. Oh. Actually, four. She she had we had babies within a month of one another 
four different times. <laughs> oh. So she was currently pregnant. Yeah. And my best friend was currently pregnant, which I'm sure terrified them, you know, that here I was with a, a, a baby who was gone. All and here they're, yeah. Yeah. you know, they're holding, I mean, um, his sister was due, let's see, Cassie was born in September. So his sister was due in November, I guess, October, November. Yeah. And my, my friend was due in February. So she still had, she had even longer to worry and ponder and whatever, you know? So, um, Anyway, but he he made all those calls, and I do think I called my best friend and and told her she lived in Missouri or Missouri or Michigan. I don't know. She lived somewhere at that point. Um, you know that was what was going on. So the rest of the time, we just waited. You know, in labor, and I don't think. Oh, the other thing too that happened <laughs> so sweet, since nobody knew what had happened why mm -hmm. Cassie died they didn't know what size she would be and they oh. so they brought me in all these darling little handmade dresses yeah and teeny teeny tiny ones you know teeny tiny all the way up to a full term yeah, you know yeah. and I mean I picked out a, a little pink dress for her hand smocked it was absolutely gorgeous I mean the the care and the love that went into that. And they had ladies, they told me ladies made them special for the babies. Aww. And they just, you know, they have a, a, you know, a supply of them in their whatever room and, and they keep them for, for when a baby dies and then the mother gets to choose which one, you know, she would like. And so I chose one that wasn't, you know, all the way full term, but, you know, wasn't, too, too small either. You know, yeah. I thought, you know, well, I mean, be. we didn't know how much she had weighed like the previous week at the, right. you know, the appointment and stuff. So yeah, I, I picked that out and I don't think they had, they didn't have like a little hat, you know, how usually newborns get a hat mm -hmm. and all, I have all three of my kids hats, but for some reason, Cassie didn't get a hat. I'm not sure why, but because huh. I would have kept it, you know, yeah. anyway. So I had already picked out an outfit to bring her home in, but I ended up keeping that and um, putting it in a shadow box. Okay. So I have a little shadow box memorial for her. And I, I had that sitting out because I kind of wanted to show you mm -hmm. um, if, if that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd point. love to see that at some point. Um, so, yeah. So then um, she, she was delivered at 4.43 in the afternoon. Like everyone else, it was just utter silence in the room, you know, and I was so hot, you know, of course, when you're laboring, you're hot. And yeah, I always wish they would just like put a fan on me, like <laughs> through all my labors. Can I just have a fan? No, that'll chill the baby, you know, <laughs> so, but um, yeah, so I mean, I don't remember much. I remember my doctor getting there because he had done deliveries the day before, but I yeah. think he was supposed to be in the office then on Tuesday, but he said it didn't matter. He was going to be there for this delivery. And so um, the nurses were there with me and stuff until it got closer to time. And then they, you know, they knew and everything. And then he came, he came in and bless his heart and his sweet little bow tie. And, you know, he just was just so precious and, um, you know, delivered her and, and, uh, you know, the pain wasn't quite as bad because she was smaller. She was 5'14", okay, and yeah. she was 19 and a half inches long. So Still, still a pretty good she size, was, though. I you mean, know, she was just a normal baby. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, she was 38-ish you know, weeks, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah so. and, and they say, I mean, or what I had read is that um, they usually gain a pound a week, mm -hmm. like in the last, you know, month. So that would have put her right on par with the rest of my kids. My biggest baby was eight, three, mm -hmm. you know, so seven, seven, 10, eight, three and seven, five. So she would have been right there. You know, she was just, she was just perfect. Yeah. Um, but when she came out, he um, had to take the cord from around her neck and it was wrapped five or six times. Oh. It was, I mean, it was extremely tight. And then he said right away, he said, Lori, 
she just got tangled up in her cord and couldn't get out. And, you know, of course that, you know, I just, I don't know. And he said, I have a picture um, of him standing beside me looking at her. And um, after, you know, I was holding her and he was just crying. He was just so compassionate. And he just said, you know, she probably did a lot of somersaults and gymnastics in there when she was little. And somehow she got caught in her cord. And then as she grew, it just got tighter and tighter. And I, I mean, I guess that it didn't cut off, like wouldn't be her airflow. I guess it was her amniotic fluid. Wouldn't that be what that was? Yeah, just the nutrients that she needed. Yeah. To... Yeah. Because um, cause that's what that's what they breathe in there. Right. I mean, they're not yeah. breathing air until they actually come out of. The yeah. Room. So, so, um, he said, yeah, you know, that she, and I said, why could, you know, why couldn't why didn't we know this, you know? Yeah. And yeah, but he's like, there's, there's not any way to know you just, you know, the only thing, you know, when we had that advanced ultrasound, I remember them saying, you know, here's the umbilical cord. And it looked like a bunch of bubbles, like a, like a string of bubbles. And I just remember thinking, not that they could have saved her at that point, but even with an advanced ultrasound, could you not see that it was wrapped around her neck? You know, yeah. you know, but again, there were no ultrasounds done until yeah. she was already gone. Yeah. So, um, you know, but even now, I don't know. I don't know if, if women have ultrasounds, yeah routinely they they sometimes do and but even the ultrasound technology I know that they have some that is pretty advanced but it is not it, that it is advanced not, right I, it's not that advanced and also it's not as um it's not as readily available because it's I mean it's still new and quite expensive if I'm not mistaken so sure I think yeah that makes I mean, sense yeah because still there, I, there's still plenty of umbilical cord accidents that happen and right. that's basically what, I mean, they get tangled up and, and it was never identified for one reason or the other. So, right. Yeah. Right. So, and I don't know that, it, that it could have been. Yeah. Identified. I yeah. just don't know, you know, I mean, I guess there's no way to know. I mean, yeah. Anyway, but yeah. why dwell on that? Because there was, you know, nothing I could do anyway, nothing anybody could do. So, so anyway, he, he had to leave and, um, you know, go deliver other babies. And my husband, they did the, the hospital had a Polaroid camera that oh, they gave to us to use. Great. So that was awesome. You know, um, I don't know what they do now. I mean, I guess I know a lot of people do the, you know, photographers, like mm -hmm. now I lay me down to sleep and some yeah. of those organizations do that. And boy, do I wish that we had had something yeah. like that back then. But, um, Matt had brought his um, camera. Now, mind you, this was uh, this was a manual camera, an yes. SLR camera. Yep. Uh huh. And uh, you know, with a with a lens, it had mm -hmm. to be focused. And one of the nurses that I had, her name was Heidi, and unbeknownst to us, because I'm in labor and that's there with me and all that, she's taking pictures with that camera. She had never picked up that kind of camera before ever, and her pictures are perfectly in focus. Oh. I'm like, I just know God was, I just know, I was... guiding her hands that yeah. day. What a blessing. She, she had never taken any photos with a, that type of camera and everyone is crisp and clear and just precious, you know? So she even came to see me at my house after we got back home and, and just stopped by to check on us, you know? And so she was, she was special. She was very special. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was delivery and, and we just were, um, you know, we stayed in the hospital room and I didn't want to stay overnight. I, I knew okay. that much. And like I said, there was no such thing as a cuddle cot back no. then. No, yeah, there's, yeah, which, that technology probably was very limited. Did they have any sort of uh, like time frame that you could have Cassie with you? Did they say anything um, about that? They they did. I'm, I'm trying to remember my, the, the memory is so fuzzy. I want to say it was four, four hours we had with her. Oh, okay. And she, when she came out, um, 
you might be able to see on, on the photos, I think, but when she came out, like her skin, like got, um, through the birth canal, got like a cut on it kind of, cause yeah. like her skin was already starting to break down, yeah. but they do, they do believe that she had just died on that Sunday. They, so okay. when I felt her do that humongous kick, you think it was, and I would, that was her last, I wonder if maybe that was just a last ditch effort to get your attention, to try whatever. To, yeah. Try to get free or sorry I think that upsets me more than anything just knowing that she was struggling and I didn't even know but you know they they also did like do the count the kicks thing now you know and that wasn't so prevalent back then I mean they they mentioned it to you as kind of oh it's a good thing to you know, sit down once a day, once or twice a day for 15 minutes and just kind of, you know, and I was like, I've got three kids, you know, when can I sit down for 15 or 30 minutes, you know, and in a quiet place and try to count her kids, you know, it's not going to (laughs) happen. Yeah. I mean, and I just, you know, I just regret to this day that I didn't do that because maybe I would have known sooner that she was struggling, you know, but you know, time can't fix that either. So, um, but she was, her head was very purple where the cord had been around her neck. The rest of her was, was pretty pink. She was, well, she was pink when she came out and, you know, gradually then she started graying a little bit, but the one memory it stands out to me more than anything else. I said, I picked her up and held her like this. And she was so cool. And I was so hot. And I just remember, she just felt so good. Just to hold because her body was cool. Because she wasn't alive anymore. And I just held her and used her to help me cool down I guess because I was you know sobbing and you know the the stress of the delivery and just the emotions but she was (laughs) she was just so precious and she looked like um Evan who was our second fourth son she had his round little face and um chubby cheeks and like I said she had my toes <laughs> she had my toes but she had um Evan Evan was blonde blondish when he was a little blonder than my oldest and and our daughter Abby they were both very dark hair mm-hmm. like like uh, my husband and I was blonde as a baby so Evan and Cassie were um blonde and she could tell she had a little bit of curl to her hair oh. as all of my children do because Matt has curls that um, like when they get, when they, well, he doesn't anymore. He's bald now and has been for many years, <laughs> but he, he actually shaved his head. Uh, it must've been, it was 1997. So it must've been right after Cassie, but, um, but he did have like some kind of like scalp condition that uh-huh. would like, it was his hair just aggravated it. So this is a funny story to, uh, to tell this. <laughs> in the midst of my grief, you will see that that we do have a picture of us smiling. And um, it's a little Polaroid and it's the two of us smiling. And I said it was the first selfie ever taken. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were smiling and, you know, you can only cry so much. Yes. You know, yes. you, you've got you've got to be able to allow yourself to just breathe. And, you know, so we holding up this Polaroid camera, like trying to take our picture, you know, like a selfie. And, uh, but anyway, the, the story about his hair was that he decided that he was tired of messing with it. And so, but his hair was the kind, and it was kind of longish where if it got wet, he would like shake it and it would go. Doing. I, <laughs> so he would get the they're curl. like, spring, it's like spring hair, you know, but he, um, 
came to bed when I had gone to bed. It must have been, yeah, I, it had to have been right after Cassie died. Anyway, but I was in bed and he got home late or something and came to bed. And in the middle of the night, I, you know how you kind of wake up and stir a little bit mm-hmm. and then you get comfortable and go back to sleep. And I happened to look over and I see this white orb in bed with me. And I was like, what, what in the world? And, but he had just shaved his head that night before he came to bed and it hadn't had any sun yet, sunlight on it. And the light was shining through the window and all I could see was this white round orb. (laughs) Oh, that is hilarious. No, anyway, yeah, that's a funny story for me and him, but. Lee's going to appreciate that because he shaves his head too. (laughs) Yeah, yes, yeah, he'll relate. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, you could tell that, that Cassie's hair was was a little bit curly, and um, we didn't see her eyes, so I don't know. Yeah, I'm assuming they were blue. All my baby's eyes were blue, and they've yeah. all turned green after the fact. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> so uh, that that's how it worked out. But you know, I one of the things that I find very fascinating is birth order. And um, I don't know if you've ever studied it yeah. or you yeah, know, I think read it's about it or whatever. I think it's interesting too. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so my, it usually goes, you know, birth order. Like if you have, you know, in our case, one son and then a second son, they are like polar opposites from each other. Mm. And then you have a daughter and then you have another daughter and they would be, but usually the first of each sex or the second of each sex are alike. And we just found that interesting because Cassie would have been the second born girl. Evan was the second born boy and they just looked so much alike. She looked so much like him, you know? Yeah. And um, so we, we, we've just always said through the years that we think Cassie would have looked a lot like him, even as an adult. And, yeah. you know, I mean, although we don't know, but I will say my first born son and my first born daughter are like, two peas in a Dude. pod, oh, you know? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe that would be true. I yeah. don't know. But it is but nice uh, to, to like think and almost visualize with, with your kids. Like what would, what would Cassie oh, look like? Oh, yes. Cause absolutely. I do the same thing with my son too. Like, I wonder what he would look like. And yeah. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, so yeah, that's just kind of how we've always talked about her that she would look like Evan. And I think one time, even on some app or something, there was um, where you could add your picture and it would add like a filter. Oh, yeah. And so we we put a picture of him in there and then added a woman's filter on it. Yeah. And we're like, maybe that's that, what she would have looked like, you know? Yeah. Just, I don't know. <laughs> so. I know. Isn't that yeah, it's kind of fun to think about and imagine? <laughs> so you guys decided to keep her for some time you got to take right. some polaroid selfies and pictures yeah. and stuff which is awesome <laughs> right. was there any other things that you guys did while you were in the hospital with her cuz i mean 4 hours is quite a short time if yeah. if you think about it cuz you're probably still delivering placenta and getting sewn up if needed and um right. kind of recovering yeah. from the birth itself would were you able to do any other things yeah. with her um it seemed like we probably really only had her for a couple of hours, you know, I, I know because of what you, what you were just saying. Um, I, I sang to her. That is, um, something that I, and there was an old hymn called, um, safe in the arms of Jesus. Mm. And my grandmother, I remember her singing that, you know, like when I was young and stuff. And so after I knew that she had died, I found a, a hymnal at home. And I happened to have, because I play piano and I had one there from when I was younger. And I found the song in there and I tore the page out and took it with me and sang the verses to her. Because it's all I could do. Yeah. And, you know, we um, were allowed to bathe her very gently, though, because her skin, you know, was longer because of the no cuddle cot type of thing her yeah. skin was continuing to break down so we just barely wiped her and um I have always loved baby lotion <laughs> and I used it on all my children and so I rubbed her with lotion and brushed her hair and um put the little gown on her but they weren't gonna give me a diaper oh. and I was mortified I just, I mean, it literally like put me in a panic. 
almost. I was like, my baby has to have a diaper, you know, and knowing full well that she didn't need a diaper. But, you know, bless them, they brought me a baby diaper, a little tiny diaper, and I put it on her. So, and then we had um, a couple of friends from our, our church, one of um, a girl that I'd been close to for many, many years. In fact, we went through a uh, Lamaze class with our very first babies oh. together. And um, so she came up and, and held Cassie. And then um, the uh, leader of our um, children's ministry at the church mm. that we went to, uh, that couple came up and they held her as well, you know, and yeah, so that, that was special, but you know, the, the kids, I didn't have the kids come up. Um, Rachel just kept them for us. And, you know, I mean, over the years, I've gone back and forth on that. You know, I, I wish I had. I'm glad I didn't. You know, most of the time now, though, I wish I had. But, you know, you only know now what you didn't yeah. know then because of <laughs> hindsight, yep. you know. Yep. So, so we left the hospital. I guess we probably, well, they, um, said that, you know, they would only let us have her, you know, that, that amount of time. And I remember they came in one time and said, are you, are you ready for us to take her? I was like, no, 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 please don't. So they, they let us keep her a little bit longer. And, um, so finally, I don't know, it must've been about 730. I don't know something. They came in and they said, honey, we really have to take her now. And I just, I just remember asking, can somebody please hold her? Please don't just lay her down somewhere. Because I don't know what they do in that situation. They had to wait for the, the coroner or whoever to come. But I just, I didn't want her to be alone in a room. I needed somebody to be there to hold her. So. One of the nurses said that she would keep her with her at the nurse station. She said, I'll keep her right there with me. So that was, that was special. And then um, they, of course, took me out in a wheelchair, which I, I had very easy deliveries and very easy recoveries with my babies, all four of them. And, I'm so grateful for that, but I didn't want to go down in a wheelchair right. because, um, you know, it's just, that's kind of what you do when you take the baby home, yeah. you go down in the wheelchair with the car seat and the, you know, I didn't want to do that. Thankfully it was late enough at night that it was past visiting hours. So there weren't a lot of people around and like just the front desk person or whatever. So they took me down and we got back in the car and, you know, honestly, after that, I don't remember a lot about what happened. Like, yeah. I don't remember going to pick up the kids, but we must have, you know. And um, I mean, I do know that that Ezra, um, I don't know if I said this or not about him. Yeah. Calling his little friends calling to tell friends, him about the yeah. birthday party. So I know somewhere in there that happened. I think that must have happened Monday evening. So I really don't remember what happened after I delivered her. Oh, because that was the thing. Matt um, had told me while well, we went to the funeral home. Now that must have been, let's see, they, I think they buried her. Did we bury her the next day? I think we, I think we did. We, we didn't want to have a funeral. I just, I couldn't bear that. I just couldn't. I couldn't bear having anybody there. I didn't want my parents there. I didn't want his parents there. I just wanted it just to be the five of us, you know. I'm not sure why, but you know, that was that was the only way I felt comfortable. I think a lot of that was again was shock. You know, I think yeah. that maybe had I waited a day or so, maybe I would have felt differently. But it was kind of like I just need to get this done. I got to, I've just got to say goodbye and move on, you know, because it was just so painful as it is for every mom, you know? Um, but I believe the next morning we must have gone to the funeral home. Although I don't remember that at all. Yeah. And, um, 
Matt said that, yeah, he's like, we sat at the desk and they asked us, you know, what we needed. And we said, um, well, interestingly enough, the the mortuary again was is, is in this teeny tiny little town that we had lived in previously. Mm-hmm. The, the, before we moved to Grand Rapids, we lived in a little town on the outskirts of Grand Rapids mm-hmm. because okay. that's where we had found a house to rent. Yeah, okay. You know how that is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, um, so when we went to the um, the mortuary, funeral home, whatever, when Matt told the the man his name, he's like, well. Was your was your granddad Elton? And Matt's like, yeah, he was. And he's oh. like, oh, he's like, I knew Elton. He said, the fu- what did he say? The funniest jokes I ever knew were ones your or, or you know, the cleanest jokes I ever knew were ones your grandpa told. <laughs> so, so we oh. found out then that um, actually Matt's Matt's grandpa had been the pastor at the oh. tiny little church in the cemetery where we were going to put her. Oh. And the reason that we put her there is because that's where Matt's grandparents were buried, yeah. where his um, his dad is buried there, and his mom. They shared a stone, but you know his mom wasn't gone yet. But um, so they allowed us just to bury her in that same plot or right. area where the family was. Yeah. Okay. So we did that, and um, we didn't again didn't have the money for a burial, and they took care of all that for us. No, oh. Didn't charge us a penny, and our Sunday school class or our, our small group class um took up a, a collection and paid for the headstone oh. which at that cemetery you could have a headstone yeah okay um and then um so they did that took care of that and and um yeah so we went out and and that it was later that afternoon they had already you know dug the thing they quick i mean i don't know how how quickly they can make up you know, a headstone, a gravestone, yeah. but they had the little plaque on it. I mean, they must have made it up immediately uh, because it was there when we went out there. And oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you know, the stone was, was little, it's, little. It was, it's so, tiny. you know, but it was very heavy. Um, anyway, so, yep, we went out and, you know, there's some pictures of us out there and, you know, that was the little hole. And I'm one of those people that, um, I cannot stay for the lowering of the body into the ground uh, at yeah. any funeral. Any, I mean, I could do it for my mom or my dad or anybody. Um, so I, and I couldn't do it for Cassie for sure. So I just, you know, they just had her there next to the little, you know, the grave and, and um, you know, we said our goodbyes. I think we took roses to, the grandparents' graves and, and his dad and um, left him. And then we left and they took care of the rest for us, covered her up. And that would have just killed me. There's just no way I could have watched them do that. Yeah. So yeah. No. Yeah, no, it's no, so no. final, you know, it's just that, that part is just so final. You realize it's really over. It's done, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. and then the next morning, um, we had already decided that I, I was like, I have to get out of this house. I cannot be here. I mean, I had just, the crib was up. I had just built, cleaned all oh. the baby bottles and put them up. I had her clothes all washed and, you know, and I had just done that like that week oh. before she, you know, she passed. And so, um, so we, uh, decided that next morning we got up and we loaded up the family and went and stayed, uh, for about five days with my parents, oh, okay. um, which my, um, my relationship with my parents was, was not the greatest, more so my mom than my dad. And, um, yeah, it, it wasn't an easy time. I will mention this too, cause I don't know if other moms have this issue, but with every pregnancy or every delivery I had, I got mastitis afterwards, Um, mm -hmm. which is a breast infection from a clogged duct. Yep. Every single, every single delivery. Well, there were three of them. (laughs) Um, I had gotten that. And so I had told my doctor, um, before I left the hospital, I said, I know it's going to happen again when my milk comes in. And so he wrote me out a prescription ahead of time. said, take this with you, get it filled. If you need it, if you don't need it, no big deal. And of course I did, you know, I mean, I got, I mean, to me, I mean, it's like all these things, you know, it's like, well, now I got a breast infection from clogged milk ducts because I have no baby to give it to, yeah. you know, and I never could pump milk. I, I don't know what it was. I, I, 
I had very difficult time breastfeeding mm-hmm. um, anyway, the first yeah. time around. Yeah, it w- it just was not a walk in the park. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I was never able to pump like some women can, and because of that, I I couldn't get it out. You know, mm-hmm. so I just would stand in the shower and let the water run on them, and that's where I would cry. I tried not to cry in front of my kids. I mean, I did some, but I mean, I would weep in the shower, you know, because it just felt so unfair that I should have all this milk and not have a baby, you yeah. know. Yeah. So. It it is. It feels so so unfair. Lori, did you how did you end up telling the kids? Do you remember anything about um like even at the cemetery did they understand what was happening? They were so uh, pretty yeah. young. I think okay. they did. Okay. Um, yeah, because we did, you know, after we had delivered her that night when we got home, I think we talked to them then. We okay. asked that they keep them up because we knew they weren't going to school the next morning because we were going to leave. So we just asked the, I think our friends were staying with them and we said, just keep them up so we can see them when we come home. And, and we just explained that, you know, something had happened and she had died in my tummy and, you know, we needed to bury her. Now we were going to put her in a little box. She couldn't come home and she had gone to heaven, you know, to be with Jesus and Papa and great grandma and grandpa. Yeah. Yeah. So, and they, they did understand. I mean, I'm not sure how much Abby really understood because she was just like four, Mm -hmm. but uh, in some of the photos, um, there's one in particular where she's sitting on my lap and she just has such a sad, sad look on her face. Mm-hmm. That may have even been Cassie's first birthday because there's some pictures of that in there too. So yeah. at least by her first birthday, by another year, she, she was very aware and, you know, felt, um, yeah. So. Oh yeah. That is, that's hard to, I, I just think of telling our child, uh, our daughter about our How old passing. was she? She was like three and a half. She would have been mm-hmm. like right around three and a half um, when that happened. And so that was, that was difficult. And, and yeah. it, like, you're right, just grasping it, but not totally fully grasping it. And right. Yeah. So I think maybe it's easier for, for people like maybe to say, oh, she went to heaven, even yes, if you exactly. don't necessarily believe in heaven or something, yeah. you know, somehow I think it helps kids maybe because it, I don't know, maybe it seems like everybody knows of heaven. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. A better but, place. Yeah. And that's that's yeah, essentially what right. we told her too. And but she was really sad that we couldn't bring him home. And right. she sure. was pretty stoked to have a little brother. And so <laughs> you know, you know that and how that goes. So Yeah. Well, of course, because they're, you know, they they've seen mommy's tummy grow yeah, for yeah. nine months. Exactly. And then all of a sudden nothing comes out of the tummy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. There's nothing to show for it. And that's hard, that's right. Hard to understand. About it. Lori, thank you so much for sharing Cassie's story. I I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry that I've been so emotional. I honestly oh, did not think that it would be no. that emotional for me. But no, I yeah. there. <laughs> like we said before, it, like whenever we talk about our kids, it's just hard not to. <laughs> it to is get a little sure. bit teary eyed because they are just so sweet and so attached to us and part of us. And yeah, so yeah. but thank you so much for telling Cassidy's story. Um, oh, is there you. any last thing that you want to say about who she is and and, and what you want to remember about her? <laughs> is that, that I love her so much. I would love to have known her as an adult, like my other adult children, because I know she would have brought such good things to the world. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lori. That was perfect. Thank you. You're welcome.